decades of organizing and rebellion had given rise to a vast network of labor groups with increasing political power. Over time, these included the Grange Movement, the Socialist Party, the Greenbackers, the Populists, and Progressives, and perhaps most significantly, the Anarchist Union, known as the Industrial Workers of the World, or the Wobblies. Following the massacre at Ludlow, soldiers in Denver refused to participate in further attacks against the miners, declaring that they would not engage in the shooting of women and children. Demonstrations erupted across the country. A march occurred in front of the Rockefeller offices in New York City. A clergyman protested outside a church where Rockefeller liked to give sermons, only to be beaten by police. In modern parlance, it was a PR nightmare. Ivy Lee went to work for, among other clients, the Rockefellers. The Rockefeller family, after the Ludlow massacre, hired, used Eddie Lee to manage the public perception around that event and other events. Ivy Lee's specialty was crisis management. Uh, among other things, he's credited with inventing the press release. In October 2001, George W. Bush signed into law what civil libertarians characterized as an all-out assault against the Bill of Rights. It was called the Patriot Act. During the Great War, similar bills were passed. The Espionage Act of 1917 and the Sedition Act, passed a year later, authorized huge fines and lengthy prison terms for anyone who obstructed the military draft or encouraged what was termed disloyalty to the state. The sweeping legislation was quickly put into effect and first on the list were the Wobblies. In many ways, the Wobblies were the most impressive example of a union movement in the history of the U.S. working class. Wobblies was the nickname for an organization called the Industrial Workers of the World, IWW, which flourished in the first decade and a half of the 20th century. The American Federation of Labor, which was the main craft union at the time, refused to organize African Americans immigrants and um, women workers. So that meant excluding the vast majority of the working class from the union movement. Along come the Wobblies and they set out from the beginning specifically to organize immigrants, women, African Americans alongside white workers in what they called one big union. They led some of the most successful strikes. One of their strikes was the first sit down strike at the time. Women workers played leadership roles, something that was absolutely unheard of at the time. Their philosophy was a revolutionary philosophy. It's known as anarcho-syndicalism. A federated, decentralized uh, system of free associations incorporating economic as well as social institutions would be what I refer to as anarcho-syndicalism, and it seems to me that it is the appropriate uh, form of social organization for an advanced technological society in which human beings do not have to be forced into position of tools, of cogs in a machine. On September 5th, 1917, Federal agents raided offices of the Wobblies across the nation, leading to arrests for the offense of causing insubordination, disloyalty, and refusal of duty in the military and naval forces. 101 of the defendants were found guilty and received prison sentences up to 20 years. Wilson carried out a brutal uh, uh, internal repression called the Red Scare, which is the worst in American history, far worse than McCarthy far worse than anything that's going on now. Uh, they arrested thousands of people, uh, smashed the labor movement, uh, 
heavy constraints on free expression through lots of people in jail, you know, expelled all sorts of people from the country. Yet what had started as a hunt against radicals soon spread to every corner of American society. Patriots were encouraged to inform on friends and neighbors who spoke out against the war, while surveillance increased dramatically, not only by the military, but by seemingly benign institutions like the postal system. The state flourishes in time of war. The state goes stronger in time of war. The state accumulates power. The military is enhanced. The forces of repression are enhanced. War is an opportunity for the government to grow in power. By the time the war ended, the total number of deaths had reached approximately 9.7 million soldiers, with millions more suffering life-changing injuries and severe post-traumatic stress. To what end was not clear. The mass of bloodshed had not made the world safe for freedom and democracy. What it had done was produce enormous fortunes for a handful of corporations and banks while leaving the worldwide labor movement in disarray. If the Great War had been a test of the Constitution and the concept of balancing the powers by each other, it failed. The United States Supreme Court established in Schenck v. United States and Abrams v. United States that the federal government could suspend constitutional rights when the nation faced, quote, a clear and present danger. Randolph Bourne, speaking of the Great War as a whole, responded preemptively with a now famous dictum. War, he said, is the health of the state.